uh, because I think we, we have quite a bit to do and I don't want to go much beyond 5 p.m. tonight because it's been a long day for everyone already. And of course, I'm going to give you a lot of homework. Uh, so I want to leave you time to do it until uh, before tomorrow morning. I'm only half kidding here. Okay, so uh, maybe I want to, to start this first by uh, asking you a few questions so that I know who I'm talking to. I kind of have, uh, yeah, if you could switch on your camera for a minute or two, so it's easier to talk to people you can see. Um, I, I want very, very, very quickly in like a one minute uh, run a very simple survey on your programming skills. Okay, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions and I assume, that's a good test first, that you can all react by doing this. Okay, you see me doing this? Okay, can you all do that? Show me that you know where that button is. That's the first test. <laughs> Ooh, you don't want to fail that one or you're in trouble. <laughs> okay. I assume you can all do this. Great. So after a while, it turns itself off. Okay, that's great. So if you, uh, what I want to ask you now is to answer yes by doing that. And if you don't do that, it means no. Okay, that's simple. So who has programming experience in Python? Good. If you don't find the button, just do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We'll let the fingers go down. Who has programming experience in another language? MATLAB, C, Fortran, whatever. Okay. Good. I assume mostly MATLAB, which is quite heavily used now. Yeah. And then last last question: Who has used and is reasonably familiar with what I call, I'm gonna use a big word here, Jupyter Notebooks. Oops. Okay, that's less now. Good, so I'm gonna to have to do some very basic introduction. Um, hopefully it won't take more than 15 minutes, but uh, if, you know, if you don't know, for example, how to use Jupyter Notebooks, uh, I have to go through some very simple steps that will allow you to enjoy this. Okay, I'll keep the chat open, but as you people tell, tell me when I code and I use my, uh, you know, do some programming, I get pretty intensely focused on what I'm doing. So I'm not gonna be able always to look at the chat. Don't hesitate to interrupt me and, and use the microphone, okay? I think the bandwidth is good enough here that we can do this. Uh, so let's try to make this as interactive as possible. Can you hear me clearly? Yep. Okay, that's why I'm using this, so there's no echo and all that. Okay, great. So I'm going to start obviously now by sharing my screen, and uh, I'm I'm going to show and do things, and give you instruction. So I'll try to go slowly. Sometimes maybe I'll go too fast. You tell me. Uh, I will try to ask you as often as possible. Are you okay with this? Can you do this? Are we all ready? Let's continue. Okay. Please be honest. Don't don't let yourself drift away. There will be plenty of time later today for you at home to play with this if you want to. I think it's the kind of thing that once you, you've done it, it becomes almost a bit addictive. And so I'm quite sure that you're gonna play with this, almost like a video game, you'll see. I mean, okay, so I'll start sharing my screen. Um, and uh, why doesn't it let me share my screen? Uh, it's all frozen here. Oh my God, this is not what I want now. Okay, what's happening here? Well, my Zoom is frozen uh, for some unknown reason. Hmm, that's not a good sign. So I'm gonna quit and come back in a minute, guys. Sorry about that. I just don't wanna... Yeah, my Zoom is completely frozen. I don't have access to any command now. Oh, sorry. Uh, everything is frozen. Ah, leave the meeting. That's not a good sign. I can't believe this. This has never happened before. I think the off and on again rule is always a good mm. 
strategy. I, I, I've got everything is frozen on my computer. I don't oh. know what has happened. Okay. I guess we'll have to wait until you uh, come back. Yeah. yeah. But just uh, take your time, Don. Feel under yeah, pressure. Yeah, no I've uh, got. I've got a question as long as we're waiting. Um, who, of, Which one of you is going to present something at the ETU? I suppose you, all of you? No? Okay, because the deadline of the abstract is tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, if you want to present something, you should. It was yeah, it it was postponed. Really? Yeah, yeah, until the next Wednesday, if I'm mistaken. Yeah. Ah, okay. They postponed it for a week. Ah, did yeah. Okay. I have a question too, while we're kind of on pause. Um, will the PowerPoints and recordings be shared with us? And um, yeah. Hmm. It's a good question. No one knows. <laughs> no one can answer. <laughs> Maybe we should ask Sebastian. <laughs> Oh, probably Cecile, I think. Yeah, Cecile, maybe she, she can answer that. Or Milika. I yeah. don't know. They can, I don't know, upload it to the website when it's ready or whatever. Yeah. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. I think but we cannot see you. You cannot see me. There we go. I think it was my mouse that killed, died on me. So that's why I couldn't do anything. Now it seems to work. Let's try to share my screen. Yes, I can. And here you go. You, can you all see you and me? Good. So um, what I'm going to do um, is First, uh, very briefly go through the uh, running of the Jupyter Notebooks with you. I remind you very simply that you should have um, uh, downloaded Fastscape and with uh, Benoit Bovy, you know, if, you, if you type GitHub Fastscape, um, you, you will get directly into the, the repository on GitHub and we've set up uh, a special branch, as we call it, on the repository for uh, this Dragonstone uh, class. And I remind you that there are three different ways in which you can run Fastscape and the uh, notebooks that I'm going to use today. One is the binder, one is using Docker, and one is using Conda. All right. Today, I strongly, strongly advise you to use Docker, although some of you may have been very brave and installed you know, using Conda. Um, for the long term, if you want to use Fastscape in the future, you should uh, use the Conda uh, option because it's more flexible and then you can update uh, as we just keep uh, developing Fastscape, you can update it. Binder is really, I'm going to click on it, you know, uh, run on Binder. What happens is that you're going to run the notebooks that I've given you automatically on a computer which is sitting somewhere on the cloud. And the problem with that first, as you see it, it's going to take a while before that computer responds that I'm ready. I'm happy to give you compute times for you to do this. And the other problem with it, here we go. See, you can do it. It seems to work. Everything is there. And this is what you should be looking at is this, this uh, uh, window. This is what we should all end up with, which is you know, how we run these Jupyter notebooks. Can, uh, can you think, see it? I think we no. have a problem with the screen. We don't see it. We just see the I internet see the page with the web page. Oh. Do you we see this? Can... I think the problem is the way uh, Zoom shares screen. You have yeah. to. Yeah, maybe you have. 
Okay. Every time you change. Yeah, let, let me do it again. Okay. I, I'll, I'll unshare and stop share. Sean, I think, I think when I'm you I'm going to go to my big computer. Uh, now, what do you see? Mm, see. Black screen. Started greening. Nothing. Double click to enter. Nothing. Okay. Right. Well. Um, no, but wait a bit because it's as it's it says Jean Brown has started screen sharing, so it's yeah, going to take a bit of time. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, wait. I think uh, you can select one option where you share the entire yeah, desktop. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do that and go simply in the browser. Uh, now, can you see something there? No, they are not. No, but this this is normal, Jean. It, it's it really does need. Um, yeah, but it, it should happen faster. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. It's because I'm trying to use two screens, I believe. Um, let let me go to a single screen and try again. This is not a good sign. Um, here, can you see better? No, nothing. No, but again, I, I think you still need uh, some time. To need yeah, break. but if it takes that long, then it's not going to be very interactive every time I type something and you don't see it, you know. Uh, uh, well, when it's a new sharing, it takes time, but then it's fast afterwards. I. Um, because when you share, you can share desktop or you can share screen. Or yeah, can... I know. I, I'm. I'm. Sure I've tried both options. Ah, now we see something. Now it's, now it's there. Yeah. Can you see this? Uh, Jupiter yeah, it's notebook? the binder. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's so we're not going to use binder. I'm going to go back to. Uh, so, did you see me change the web yes. page? Yes. Yes. Okay, we're going to use the Docker here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I assume you have all installed Docker and run this command here, which basically using Docker pulls it onto your computer. What Docker does, it brings like a, a, a container, as they call it, which is in fact uh, like a computer that's going to run on your computer. Okay. The nice thing about it is it's going to run regardless of what you have on your computer. It will have all the libraries. It will actually run things in Unix for us, even if you have a PC, if you have a Mac, or if you have a Unix machine. Okay. So this is some what you should have already done because it takes about you know half an hour or so to download all the bits that it needs. And now we're going to use this this uh, command line here, and we're going to run this in a terminal. What's really important before I do that in front of you is that you realize that this this path here, you see what I've highlighted? Mm -hmm. Yes. Should be a, a path to a directory on your computer. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is this little computer we're going to run separately, the Docker uh, container, okay, only has access to his own little hard drive or fake hard drive. Okay, and if you stop for any reason, you go for a cup of tea and you stop the Docker, everything is lost. All the change you've made are lost. So what we're going to do is give Docker access to one of our, you know, a little bit, a little folder on our computer, on your computer, so that you can store stuff there. And when that little computer Docker dies or turns off, whatever we've done and save will be saved on your hard drive and you can come back to it. Okay, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to copy this. Okay, and now hopefully um, I, I'll need to go back to share another window. And hopefully now, if I go share my, share my desktop, you can see everything that I'm doing. Are you? Can you see everything now? Or is it still black and takes some time? No, we see the lines like Docker run and so on. Okay, the, the web so, page. What okay, good. And and if I do this. Uh, we cannot see a terminal yet. No, okay, sorry. It's it's um, because I'm asking not to use my entire desktop. But in one, one let me. Okay, now, can now you see we it? see it. Yes. 
Okay, I'm gonna make the font a little bit bigger so you can see what I'm typing. And so I'm gonna paste, okay, I'm just pasting what I copied directly from the website. But really importantly, before I hit return, I'm going to edit this to put a path on my local disk, which in this case is user. My name is Jay Brown on my disk. And I've created a, a directory in my temp directory, which I'm gonna call Dragonstone. Okay, and now this is going to use, and I'm going to show you on my hard drive here. You see, in Jean Bon, there is a temp, and in temp, there is a thing called Dragonstone, which is empty. All right, so but I have to create it, it has to be there. And now I'm going to run this command, okay, with there the path where there's this empty folder. Don't change the rest, it's all the same. Uh, on, a, on a PC, you may have to be a little bit more clever because you know, the PC path contains columns and therefore you have to put your path name into uh, you know, um, uh, inverted commands there, okay? So if I wanted to do it for, I'll do it quickly. For a PC, it would have to be something like you know, this, then I think it writes like this on a, you know, my dear. Okay, but you have to put it between uh, two um, semicolon, whatever you call it, I forgot. My name. But on a Mac, you don't need to because there's no special characters in. So I'll write it again. Okay, and now you hit return and it's going to execute this, this command. And what happens is that it starts the Docker. So it started a small computer on my computer and I've asked that computer to run this here called Jupyter Lab, okay? And Jupyter Lab starts a notebook server. And what is a notebook server? Well, it's a program that's running on my computer. In fact, it's running inside a small computer that I just run on my computer. And it's going to talk to my web browser. And here you have an address that you're going to copy and paste into a new tab on your, on your web browser, okay? So problems now I have this share thing that's coming up. So I'll move it a bit. See, I paste this long address, which starts with HTTP and then finishes by a lot of gibberish and you hit return and you should see, you know, the web browser in which now is running your JupyterLab server in which will allow you to read the notebooks and play with them. Don't do anything, okay? If I assume now everyone has this running on this computer either this way or using Conda installation, uh, you should have a similar view. Now, one thing to notice here, very important, okay? Is that mm, on your root directory, okay? At the root of your disk is actually are only these things. Why? I don't see any of my files, okay? Because you're running now a container, you're in a small computer, which has his own hard disk and in which you only have the notebooks that I have written for you. But you also have access to that folder. Here have called my local folder. That's on my hard disk, okay? So it's a bridge between the small computer and my real hard disk. I can come back by clicking on that folder sign here to the main root, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do, okay? We're gonna take the notebooks and copy them onto my local folder. So they will be on your hard disk. There's many ways you can do this. You know, if you want to follow what I do, I click on terminal here. It's going to open a terminal, okay, um, inside the browser, but on my little computer. And I can type Linux commands here. And I'm not going to teach you Linux. All we're going to do is copy CP minus R, means recursively, copy the folder and all its subfolders. So what do I copy? I copy notebooks, which contains all the notebooks that I'm going to play with with you. And I'm going to copy them in my local folder. Okay, so CP minus R for recursive, notebooks, my local folder. And you notice here that there is a space in between each of these. Huh? So copies the command minus R. Can you see my cursor? Minus R is an option. Then I copy what? I copy the folder notebooks into the folder, my local folder. And then you hit return. Nothing seems to be happening. But now if I go into 
my local, you know, user Jean Bohm temp Dragonstone, bingo, here I have all the notebooks, okay, now on my hard drive. And if the server, if the container crashes, or if when I go to sleep, I turn my computer off, these files will be preserved, even though the, you know, the fake little computer, the, the, the container is not running anymore. So if I go back to this now, I can also look in my local folder, okay? And I have now the notebooks, but these are on my computer hard drive. They're not on this fake computer. And so what I want you to do now is whatever we're going to do, stay there, okay? Don't go back to this because this will go away, okay? As you, when you turn the, the, the fake computer, all this will go away. So let's make sure that we stay in my local folder all the time, all right? And if I open the notebooks, you know, I have a set of four sets of exercise and notebooks that we're going to run and play with today, all right? And then and the day after today. So let's go back to my local folder here. Everybody must have that now, hopefully. And I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to do a little bit of basic Python and basic uh, NumPy, okay? For everyone to understand what's happening. So I'm gonna create one notebook, a, a, an empty notebook. And for that, you use this plus sign, okay? Note that if you do it while you are in the my local folder, it's going to create a notebook in that folder. So if I do plus, if that's what you wanna do, it's this launcher comes up and I click on notebook, Python 3 and bingo, it's created a notebook. And it's given me the, given him the name untitled.ipy notebook. And it's created it here, you see? It's an empty notebook, but it's created. And now we're gonna do something with that notebook, okay? And this notebook, if, if you can see, you know, maybe I want to make this as small as possible. Here we go, okay? Um, I don't see you guys. I don't see the, 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 uh, the chat. So you have to talk to me if, if you wanna communicate with me, okay? From time to time, I'll have a look here so I don't completely lose you. Let's see if I can put the chat. Uh, what have I done? Oh no, what have I done? Sorry, I'm terrible. Now we see uh, it again. Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe I wanna put the chat on. Yeah, no, I'll put the chat here so I can look at you guys, hopefully. Okay, uh, so- you show the last step again, please? Uh, just... Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm gonna kill this, don't worry. Nothing, you know, I can, I know, uh, I know. Uh, so you, you should have looked like this. If you go in this My Local folder and do plus, click on plus, it should ask you what you wanna do. I say, I wanna create a notebook. So you click on the Python 3 notebook because you could have notebooks in R or in other languages. And that's what it's doing, okay? It's created a notebook, can, untit name untitled, blah, blah, blah. And you can rename it either there or there. If you right click on it, then you can say rename and like say my first notebook. Okay, so we're not going to do this much, um, but just to give you a few a few things to to help you play with this. Now, what is a notebook? Well, a notebook is just made of cells like this. Okay, and you can create more cells as many as you want by clicking the plus here, and you can remove them by cutting them off. Okay. Very simple. And what do you do with a cell? Well, you write Python commands, okay? So you can, for example, say x equals two, okay? And if I hit return, it goes to the next line and then show me x, okay? Uh, or uh, let's go print x. So these are Python commands. But you see, as I type them, nothing happens. For a notebook to execute a cell, you need to have you know, the blinking cursor in that cell you see there, and the cell is highlighted in blue and you need to hit shift return. So return simply adds more line, but shift return execute the code that's in the cell. And x equal to print x, you get a two, okay? Everyone has that worked out? Yes. Okay, now Python, even though everybody talks about it and say we should all use Python, Python is pretty, pretty dumb, okay? <laughs> you can do things like, you know, 
x. If we just say x, it will show you what's in x. You can do x squared. It knows what x squared is. But, and you know, don't play with this as I'm doing it, but I just want, for example, to count the square root of two. Doesn't know, doesn't know what square root means. You can be a bit smart and say, okay, I'm gonna put two to the power, you know, 0 0.5 or something like that. Yeah, now I get the square root. But it doesn't even, it wouldn't know, for example, what the log of two is or the sign of two. It has no knowledge of all these potentially very basic uh, operation. So what we have to do before we all this is load a package or a library that has all that knowledge. This is what Python is good about that millions of people have developed packages and libraries that are online and you can just download them and use them, okay? So Fastscape is one of those. This is what Benoit Bovy and, and me and others in the section here have done. And this is what we're going to use. But one that is very, very important for everyone to use is NumPy, which stands for numerical Python, okay? And to access it, you have to import it into your notebook. So you have to say import NumPy, that's the name of the library. And because we are lazy, we don't want to have to, it'll see, we'll have to type NumPy all the time. We're gonna give it a nickname and we're gonna call it NP because it's shorter, okay? And if you hit that, nothing happens, but it has imported NumPy. And now I can write, you know, NP, as I have to say, it's in NumPy, square root of two. It works. I can say, what's the log? That's the natural log of two or the log in base 10. That's the log in base 10 of two. I can calculate the sign. Oops, sorry. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so if it has all these mathematical functions. One other thing that it has, and it's really why the way we, we should use NumPy is it's really good at dealing with vectors or arrays rather than numbers. And you'll see for us, it's really, really important that we understand this concept of vectors. So X, as I've declared it, is just a number, okay? It holds one number. But with NumPy, we can define what I call arrays. And the, the best way to define an array I'm going to show you is create an array of zeros. What is it? Well, it's a function called zeros in NumPy that creates an array full of zero. And then it needs an argument is how long do you want it to be, okay? And here I say 101 zeros, and then I'm gonna show you it. There it is. Now you see it's an array of a vector that has 101 zeros in it. There's another one that's pretty useful, is ones, okay? So remember, I'm, I'm doing this by overwriting over and over the same cells. You can do, you know, if you wanna keep stuff, just, you know, oops, NP. Just put it in a different cell and it will keep track of everything you've, you've done, okay? I don't want to do this. I'm, I'm going to overwrite myself a lot, but uh, this is very, very basic stuff. And here you see I've mistyped it. There's a thousand and one. It means it can't show them all. So it's actually showing you the beginning and the end. Now, if I do a hundred, it feels like it can show you the hundred and one. Another very, very useful uh, NumPy uh, uh, um, function is to create um, uh, a, 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 a range or, or a vector that's filled with numbers that increase from one to another in a given number of steps, okay? I know that this thing is called lin space. If you don't know, just go on the web and type numpy function to create array of increasing numbers, okay? And you go through this, this one called NPA range. I'm sure if you keep looking down, there will be one about NP uh, lint space. The point is that there is no real manual for NumPy or for Python. It's all on the web. And if you need have a question, try to find a function or how to write something, just type it in Google and it will find it for you. If you found in on the web or you remember I should use LinSpace, the next thing you should do is get the documentation about LinSpace. And for that, what you should do is write LinSpace like I've done here, np done LinSpace. You can even put parentheses, but you don't know what the options are. So you do this and you see where I've put my cursor now here in between the brackets. It would work a bit before or a bit after, but I like to put it in between there. And I'm gonna type on my keyboard, shift tab. 
And this shows you now a manual of all the options and all even as even an example of how to use a lint space, okay? And that's true for most libraries and most functions in most libraries, okay? So I know here that I need to put a starting number, a stop number, and then enough number of points. And these are green, so it means that they're not, uh, they are not uh, uh, compulsory, okay? So I'm gonna simply do this. I'm gonna say, I want to go from zero to one, and I want 101 of them, because I like that number. And this is what I get, okay? I get an array that's filled with 100 numbers, 101 numbers, sorry, starting from zero and finishing in one, and they're evenly spaced. Okay, simple. Now I can call that X and I can start calculating now the square of X and to look at it. What's really good about NumPy and Python in general, but NumPy is that it's, it can do operations on arrays. Okay, so if I do this, you see it's taken the array X. It knows it's an array because I've defined it as a NumPy array by using MP, MP in space. It's put it, when I say put it to the square, it knows that what I mean is to put all the numbers in the array to a, a square value and create a new array that stores the results. That's why, okay? In fact, every time you do this, any operation you do on arrays that you can write like this, like a, we call an array operation, will be performed extremely efficiently. Okay, so we always want in NumPy and in Python in general to try to write everything in terms of operations on arrays and things will go super fast. As soon as we want to do things on the, um, uh, uh, scalar numbers, one by one, Python is, and, and NumPy are super slow. Okay, so you have to remember that. Now another very useful, and I, I the last thing I, I'm going to, to illustrate with this, another very, very useful uh, library. So you see, I can come back to this uh, cell, but and I will run it. And whatever I run in that cell will 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 become, you know, whatever the, that uh, Jupyter notebook knows. I could do this in the next cell here. It makes no difference. Okay, let's do this here. The other library that I really really is very useful is the plotting library. And the one that everybody uses is matplotlib, matplotlib, and a uh, a subset of it, the one that works uh, in, in Python, okay? So it's matplotlib.pyplot, and we usually abbreviate it as plot, PLT, okay? So if I hit return, it's loaded matplotlib.pyplot, which I don't want to say more, uh, in, in my notebook, so I can use it, and it's name it plot. And one of the very interesting now that I have is that I can plot stuff, okay? And for example, I can go back to this cell now. This one has been run. So my notebook knows about plot, meaning my plot lib dot by plot. So I can use it in any cell now. So I'm gonna go plot and there's a function to plot, which is plot, okay? And that function is really useful because if I plot two array, one against the other, I got a beautiful uh, plot of array x, sorry, array y versus array x. It always comes up with this little gibberish here, which you can get rid of if you put a, a, a semicolon here and it looks neater, but you don't have to, okay? I'll keep forgetting it. And you know, you can do lots of stuff. You can do this, but you can now plot on top of that because it's in the same cell. Uh, we can plot uh, the, you know, the fourth power put the second power to the second power, that's the fourth power. And you see the two plots are superimposed in the same diagram. Okay, so is everyone managing to get these things? I'm not saying to reproduce everything I've done, but, but to uh, play a little bit with these uh, uh, cells in a notebook. Um, the, the key thing to remember, okay, is when we're going to go now in the notebooks that I've prepared for you is to run a cell, you need to be in that cell and hit shift return. Okay, that executes the cell, any cell. If you want to modify a cell, just go in it and then hit return, no shift return, and you can add a line and you can type whatever you want, okay? Uh, another important thing is you will see many of the cells that I have don't do much, they're just full of text, okay? 
So if I want to create a new cell, I remind you after that one, I'm going to use the plus here that creates a new cell and it has created a new cell. By default, when you create a new cell, it's one in which it expects some code, okay? But there are two other types of cell and the most important one for us is the markdown cell. So you see, I'm in this cell, it's been selected. Okay, I'm gonna turn my mail off, otherwise we're gonna be, oh, I think it's still some meetings, even though I'm not, it doesn't matter. Um, so this cell that I've highlighted and which that I've selected, I can turn it here into a markdown cell. And you see, it loses its little number here. And now in that cell, I can, hello, uh, uh, my name is Jean, all right? And if I execute that cell, all it does, it turns it into a good looking character set. And it's just a comment, okay? The language it's using is called Markdown, which is some kind of a, you know, a shorthand for HTML language. Don't learn it, but you, things you can do is, for example, put a title, okay? Or you can put, you know, I'm very, uh, I like my name, so I'm going to put it in italic, okay? Or I can put it in, in, in you know, uh, bold and things like that. More importantly for me, for those of you who like this, is that I can put formula, okay? And I'm, for that, I'm actually using LaTeX, okay? If, if sorry, I should do this in LaTeX, okay? And if for those of you who know LaTeX, it's, it makes really beautiful equations into your notebook. And this is what I've used a lot. Now, once this is created, when I'm gonna run my, my you see, um, my notebook and the various cells, these get just skipped over and reproduce and nothing really changes. So they're a very nice way to um, illustrate and document your notebooks. And you'll see I've made great use of that. Okay, so, but most of the cells, make sure when you want to execute a cell that it does something in Python, that it must be a code cell. This one is a markdown cell. And finally, if you want to put that cell above that one, because you'd like the title to be above that, you know, you select that cell, okay? And you see the blue appearing here. The blue line you can then take if you click next to it you can actually move it to another position and now it's on top here okay fine with this everybody uh, yes. Okay. yes yes so don't forget when you also edit and make your own cell every see it says here at the bottom save completed regularly that uh, notebook is going to be saved to disk just to make sure, I'm gonna turn this, you know, close it down, just to make sure is you uh, Apple save, or you can go, you know, into file. Uh, sorry, uh, it's not there. Oh, what have I done? Uh, done that. Where have I gone here? Okay, what, what, not what I meant to do here is I, in, in this here, you can save it by clicking on this, okay? But uh, in theory, it saves it every 30 seconds or so. so. It's really rare to lose that. Now I can save it. I can, you know, uh, uh, turn, click it off. Okay. And if I want to get back to it, I just double click here and it comes back. Notice one thing that uh, for each notebook that you're going to create, there is a Python engine behind it. Okay. And if I, if I uh, turn this off like this, you'll see there's still a green dot next to my uh, notebook. It means that the Python engine is still running. And you can have a list, if you push here, you can have a list of all the kernel, as they're called, or the Python engine that are running between, uh, behind each of your, of your notebooks, okay? And you can shut it down. If I shut it down, nothing happens. It's just that the Python uh, notebook now, you know, you see it doesn't have the real red dot next to it. When I click back to it, it restarts the Python engine and I can run it again, okay? It's just a, a minor point. Notice here that I've run this cell before I run this one. And that meant that that one didn't know yet that I, I needed to import my plot lib. So it didn't know what plot means and it didn't run. It says plot is not defined. But if you now I run this one and then run this one again, it will work. So in general, what you do is all your imports, you put them right at the beginning here, okay? So that everything below knows and as imported knows about all the libraries you know. Okay, so now let's save this and get rid of this. No, and we're going to move to the notebooks I've prepared for you. So this is a source to sync course. So we're going to have the mountain source, first one. Then we're going to have the basin transit, and then the marine sink. 
and hopefully on Friday we can all put it all together and look at you know the, the real purpose of the source to sink uh, approach to studying a sedimentary system is look at signal propagation what happens in this complete system made of a source a transit and a sink what happens when a signal is created in the source how does it transfer or propagate through the whole system and we'll illustrate that but let's first start with the mountain source so if you go in the mountain source okay um, you'll have many notebooks and um, we're going to try today to go through maybe the first two or three okay i hope to get to the three if we're ambitious ambitious we could go to the fourth but we have time tomorrow okay there's no there's no rush what's important is that you feel comfortable about using these notebooks and you understand what you do um, one thing you may want to do okay is is uh before we, we start anything is go back to to uh uh, your notebook here and maybe I think we can you know the mountain source uh, let's move the chat uh, uh, I don't think we can do this now this this um, browser here if you want is not very smart so if you go in mountain source maybe you know um, uh, you, you you can uh, save the original somewhere uh, but you know um, one way would be, for example, to duplicate a notebook. You can always duplicate a notebook, and and that will give you keep you will keep a, an unmodified uh, copy of it. I strongly advise you to do that, or you know you can always go back to and um, don't do this now. Okay, you can always go back here, and there's always a version, an original version of the notebook, see, because we're not going to touch that one on on the image. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to go back here because I want to, to go on my disk, not on the fake machine disk, and I go there. But I want you really to modify these notebooks as we go on. I, we don't want them to be intact like I gave them to you. Okay, so let's open the first one. The first one has, doesn't have much uh, in it except a lot of text, okay? Uh, it's just a recap of what we, we, did, we did with Sebastian today. It's a little bit more complicated, but uh, we're going to only look at what Sebastian has done today uh, has talked about is the stream power law, um, or you know the law that tells us how channels or rivers inside to bedrock. And the reason this is very important is because we believe that you know in a mountain bed like this, okay, uh, this this is a, a picture I've actually taken from a plane on my way back from uh, the AGU a few years ago of the Henry Mountains. Uh, in, in, in uh, the Western US. And you know, the Henry Mountains is this place where uh, Gilbert, you know, a very famous geologist and American geomorphologist went to in you know, the, the late 19th century on, on donkey back. And actually from this trip, he wrote a, a report uh, of, it, of his field work that you know, still serves as the basis for a lot of what we do in, in geomorphology. And that's where he, you know, he stated, I think it was for the first time that you know, he considered that the incision of rivers by bedrock must be proportional to the, the discharge of the river. So the speed of water flowing in the river and the volume of water and to the local slope, which is the basic uh, hypothesis behind the stream power law. So if we are in, in a mountain like this, really the rate at which this mountain is eroded we think is set up by the rate at which the rivers incise into the bedrock. By incising into the bedrock, the rivers create slope, they create valley sides, and then other processes, which we'll, we'll, we'll see maybe a bit later, act to uh, um, uh, you know, move material along the sides of these valleys to help the whole systems to erode away. But the pace at which this is all happening, we believe is set by the incision of the rivers. So this is the basic equation. Uh, Sebastian will use Z for elevation. Here I'm going to use mostly H, okay? I like to keep Z as a vertical coordinate and H as the variable that represents topographic elevation. And so if we forget about this term, which has to do how we represent the side, uh, the, 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 the valley or the hill slope uh, evolution with time, which will come to a, another time, this is the equation we're trying to solve, okay? And uh, it says that the rate of change of surface topography is due to tectonic evaporation minus erosion. 
And the erosion here follows the stream power law. It says that the erosion is a constant. We discussed what these constants mean. Times the product of the drainage area to some power and the slope, the local slope to another power. Okay, so I'm going to forget about this. Okay, and I'm left only even with this if I forget about about you, the uplift Why? Because I've spent a lot of time in the past years to write a very very efficient uh, method to solve this equation. I don't have the time to go into details of that, but you will see it's super efficient. We're going to be able to play with these notebooks almost to create topographies and, and, and landscapes in a matter of, of less than a second. So we can actually play with this equation, change the parameter and see what happens at will. Now, uh, to come back to this top equation here, um, uh, I, I, um, as, as mentioned uh, earlier uh, by Sebastian, uh, we can look at, at, a, at a, an interesting case, which is the one in which we have reached steady state. And this is something we're going to try to do today is bring, create a landscape that goes to steady state and analyze it. And maybe if we have the time, look at the profile of one river in that landscape. Now, um, the only thing maybe um, I want to tell you about, about the FastScape algorithm is based on this diagram, I hope you can all see it. Can someone say yes or no? Because I, I want to make sure you're still there. I yes, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Talking to myself here, it's just weird feeling. So I'm happy to hear your voice from time to time. Good. Uh, so uh, this, these nodes here, these points, okay, correspond to us uh, do what we call discretizing the landscape. So we're going to take points in space, you know, they may be separated. So this is you know, a plan view. We're looking from top here at, at the region on the surface of the earth. And we're gonna put a node like this every kilometer or every meter. You know, we, we decide on the spacing between these nodes. And here I have put them totally almost randomly and connected the nodes by triangles, okay? It doesn't matter. Later, and for most of the time we're going to do today, we're gonna use a regular rectangular grid, but it doesn't matter for the point that I want to make. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to solve that equation, that equation or that one huh, at one point. Okay? And then I'm going to solve it at all the other points. And that's going to tell me how the landscape is going to evolve through time. So if we look at what's happening at one point, I'm going this I to calculate uh, the stream power law. I need two things, the drainage area and the slope. And for this, I'll tell you, I need two quantities that we will uh, use later is that are very fundamental. For the node I, I'm going to decide what is the node, one of my neighbor nodes, to which if I pour water here on the landscape, in which direction the water is, it, is going to flow. And we're going to so assume that that direction is defined by the node of, you know, the one of my neighbor nodes here, that defines the steepest descent, okay? From here to here. And I'm gonna call this the receiver node, okay? So I has a receiver node, this one. The node eight here is a receiver node, it's node five. Two has a receiver node, it's also node five. Three is giving to two, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So you follow the arrows to know which one is your receiver. Seven or node I also have what I call donor nodes. And it's more than one. There's only one receiver node, but it can be more than one donor node. The donor nodes are those that have I as a receiver. They are kind of the, you know, the, the uh, opposite definition, if you want, or complementary definition. So if nine has seven as a receiver and four has seven as a receiver, we can say that four and nine are donors to seven. Okay, so for every node, I compute the donor and the receiver. And why do I do that? Because then I have a very simple way to define slope at six. I'm only going to look at the difference between my height and my receiver divided by the distance between the two. And that gives me the slope at 0.6. Okay, so it's a forward in flow if you want estimation of the slope. And if I want to estimate it at seven, I'm just say, okay, it's the difference between seven and six, the difference in height divided by the, diff, you know, the distance between the two, and that is gonna give me the slope. The other thing I need for the stream power law is the drainage area, the contributing area. Well, for that, I'm going to use the donor information. I can see that, you know, let's take 0.5. It has three donors, 
each of these donors has two donors or only one here and one here. And node one has no donor, node three has no donor, node seven has one, two donors, etc. Okay, you can see how I can go recursively from this node five going through my set of donors and the donors of the donors of the donors, etc. You can show, I don't have the time to do this here, that if you follow this donor order, you can calculate at every point going through its list of donor and the list of its of their donors and donors, etc. We can define, easily calculate the drainage area of any point on the landscape. And that's the, the strength of this fastscape algorithm that makes it so fast. But remember this concept of donor and receiver. Okay. The diffusion, we're not going to talk about it today. So that's the Just third time to the Jean? equation here. Sorry. That's Jean? representing hill slope processes. Yes. I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, I, I don't remember if you already told me, but for the nodes, uh, did you choose them like randomly or how? Did yes. You do so, that? yeah. So, uh, in this case, I've numbered that totally randomly. So, I've been one, two, three, four. You know, the numbers doesn't matter. But what matters is that for each node, I know the number, the name, if you want, of its receiver and the name of its one or many donors. But the way we've labeled them is totally arbitrary. Yeah, but I mean, like for seven, you chose to put four and nine as a donor, mm -hmm. but you could have put four as a uh, donor for three. Was it uh, like yeah. random? No, 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 no. Because it was the triangulation? Four. No, no, no. Because no, you see four, if you follow the triangulation, four is also connected to three. But remember that I've decided that every node only has one receiver, the one that is defined by the steeper slope. So it's ah, possible yes, sorry. that one- Yeah, that was that. Three and nine are also below four, but here I make the decision, no, seven is the receiver because it's the steepest one. Yes. Four, yeah. four is the donor of seven because seven is the receiver of four. But three doesn't have four as a donor because three is not the receiver of four, okay? So it's just one is the complement of the other. Now, finally, um, if you want to know more about the algorithm, I've put links. And I think if you click on these links, there's something should happen. And, and you can go there and download the PDF. So this is the paper uh, that we wrote with Sean Willett, describing in very much detail this. Uh, I won't go through all the links, but it's, I've tried as much as possible to make active links in these no notebooks towards the key references. Now. Um, other things that I've put, now that you know roughly what's in a Fastscape, is the Fastscape GitHub repository, which if you click on it, is where we all started, okay? That's the Fastscape LEM. Uh, I'm gonna turn this off, so I, I know, talk to me if you wanna communicate, like you've done, you're doing a great job. And um, uh, so this is the official Fastscape repository. If you wanna install Fastscape on your computer, you should follow the instructions here. Okay, if you go one level up, you'll also see that we have this Fastscape uh, Dragonstone, which we used uh, today, which is just a, 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 a subset of Fastscape with notebooks that I'm going to run today. But if you want the official up-to-date version of Fastscape, you should use this and this indication on how to, to install it. There is also a lot of documentation on Fastscape, which we're going to use today. Okay, so if you click on that, that's a separate page hosted somewhere else. And this all the information about Fastscape, you know, how to install Fastscape, a lot of examples uh, that you can you can run, uh, and then more information about Fastscape, which are going to come in, in, in a minute. If I come back to my Jupyter Notebook, finally, something that you have to understand, which is really important too. Fastscape was written, believe it or not, by me, <laughs> in the past you know, 10 years, and I am a lover of Fortran, okay? Which is this old man language that nobody wants to use anymore. Yet Fortran remains one of the fastest language. If you write something in Fortran, it will run super efficiently on your computer. That's why I stick to it. So what Benoit has actually done, my software engineer, Benoit Bovy, I mentioned to him, uh, to you yesterday, he's actually put wrappers around all of my Fortran libraries so that they've become Python libraries or Python functions, okay? 
took him a while. So now for you, my Fastscape, the Fastscape program is actually a set of Python functions or, or classes, but they are in fact written in Fortran. So we are changing them uh, progressively and replacing them with true Python uh, functions. But at the moment, most of them that you're going to use are written in Fortran. Now, with all these little functions and, and uh, routines that are Fortran, around which we've put a Python wrapper, we have to put them together. You know, one of them will calculate the slope. One of them will calculate the drainage area. One of them will calculate the erosion. Um, we want maybe to add uh, hill slope processes. So one will calculate the hill slope processes. Then another one will calculate the transport of sediment or whatever, okay? So these are all little routines of little functions. So what Benoit did also uh, do is he developed a, what he calls a modeling framework called X-Ray SimLab, which is a Python interface that allows you to bring together all these little functions and make a model out of that. And this is what we're going to use today. It's Fastscape, the official version of Fastscape, if you want, that's running inside this X-Ray SimLab. And you'll see what it means in a moment, but it's important you do this. Okay, before we run our first uh, 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 really useful notebook, I want to summarize what we're going to do today so that you understand really what we do. Now, we are going to solve this equation. I'm sorry, guys, but that's all we're going to do today. We're going to solve a partial differential equation. And it's a partial differential equation because we look at the variation of age, the topography, with time and with space. S here is the coordinate down the path of a, or, or the flow of water, so down downstream of a river. So we have an equation here that relates derivative of h with respect to time to derivative of, derivative of h with respect to space. That's why it's called a partial differential equation. But we also have to compute the drainage area and assume a value for kf, for m, and for n. Okay, so we're going to do this. We're going to run a model in which we're going to say, I'm giving you an M, an N, a KF, and uh, also an uplift function. And we're going to solve that equation. Okay, before we can do that, the last thing you need to know is that if you have a partial differential equation, it needs two more things. It needs boundary conditions, what happens on the sides of a domain in which you want to solve the problem. And it needs an initial condition. Because if you look, it's very interesting, you know, sorry to come back to this equation again, but if you look at this equation, this term equal this one, okay, which is the differential equation, it doesn't contain h. It only contains the derivative of h with respect to time and the derivative of h with respect to space. It only tells me how it changes with time and with space and how the two are related, but it doesn't give me the absolute value of h. So I have to give it a reference, both in space and time. If you, this equation tells me how the topography changes in space, I need at some point to say, okay, but I know it there, I know it there, it, its height is zero. And from that point, I can use that equation to tell you how it's going to vary in space because that's all this equation is telling you. So this is why we need to define an area, usually here a rectangle of dim dimension LX by LY, typically 100 by 100 kilometers, you no know, a mountain. And we're going to discretize it. We're going to define the point where we want to solve that problem. And that's, you know, we decide of a grid that doesn't have to be at the same dimension in both directions, but it can for usually too. Okay. And finally, we're going to say on these boundaries, on these four boundaries, we're going to say, for example, that the topography is zero or doesn't change through time. Okay, this is what we'll call fixed boundaries. And there are the type of boundaries we will show you in a minute. And finally, the last thing we need is to say, well, you know, we, we only know how this topography changes through time. So we need to give the code or the program an initial topography. And usually the initial topography we assume is, is a flat earth, is, is Holland. Okay, to make the, the code work a little bit better and faster, we actually put a little bit of white noise, maybe like a meter or a millimeter of amplitude white noise to start with. But think of it as a, as a flat landscape to start with. We're going to uplift it by imposing an uplift function and we're going to erode it according to the string power law. And for that, we need to give our repeat a KF, an N and an N. Okay, so enough of an introduction. Let's dive into the second notebook, which is more interesting, okay? 
that one actually has lines that we can run, okay, that, that, that will do something. And there are also these cells which do nothing. It's just, you know, putting a nice picture and putting some lengths of steps. So what I want you to do is select, like I've done here, this, this cell which imports all the bits and the, the libraries that we're going to use, okay? So you see, uh, we need this framework that Benoit has developed, that's SimLab, uh, simulation SimLab. Well, SimLab actually needs X-Array. Okay, let's, we have to import X-Array. We're gonna use a lot of NumPy's, so we're gonna import NumPy, and we're gonna do a lot of plotting. We use uh, import matplotlib, okay? And the last one, don't worry, it doesn't mean anything to you. It has to be there, you'll see in a minute why. Okay, so let's run this shell, uh, this cell. And if we do it, you know, it will take a, you know, like a, a couple of seconds, but only the first time. Now, if I run that cell again, because it's been imported already, it knows it is imported it, and it's just, you know, doesn't do anything. Okay, it, it, it just runs very fast. Now, we've got all the libraries we need. Let's import Fastscape. Okay, now Fastscapes is in fact, because I tell you there's a little, these little bits that you can combine together. What we've done is we, with the various parts that we have that computes all sorts of things, we can actually build more than one model. There is the, you know, I think uh, this one is called the basic model. We will use also the sediment model. We will use the marine model. The basic model only has this built to it, the stream power law, and then also this, this uh, uh, diffusion, uh, which we're going to get rid of right away, okay? So by running this uh, cell, what you do is you tell, you know, okay, from all the Fastscape models, there's like five or six of them, import the basic one, the one that solved this basic equation, okay? Now, what's, what's inside that, that, that model, okay? Well, if you go and you can run again, you know, the, 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 the cell here, this, that's nothing, it just repeats, uh, it's, it's a markdown cell. But let's run uh, this simple uh, uh, cell that just says basic model. So it's like, you know, when I said X equal two, and then I said X, I could see two. So what, let's see what's inside this basic model. Okay, and the basic model is going to make a list of all the processes that are in that model. And for each of the process, the variables, and especially those that are input variables. And you'll see that the first thing we need to build a model is build a grid, a mesh on which we're going to solve it. And we need to know its shape, the number of points in the X and Y direction, and its length, Y, L and X, L, let's call it. I told you we need boundary conditions. So we have to tell you know, what type of boundary conditions we want on the four sides. We need to define an uplift rate. We need to define an initial topography. Because I told you we have this term in the equation, the diffusion term here, we also need a diffusivity, KD, which gonna get, we're gonna get rid of it, I'll show you in a minute. And then we have the stream power law, which needs a K coefficient, an area exponent, that's M, and a slope exponent, that's N. And you see how looking at this basic model, we know what's in it. There's another more visual way to look at it is if you uh, do to basic model something, you call what's called a method to basic model, which is the method visualize, let's run it. It will like show you the model as a series of bubbles. And you can see, oh my God, there's already lots of stuff in it, of course, because we need to do more than just solve the SPL. We need to calculate the slope. We need to calculate the drainage error. We need to put all the bits together. Maybe, you know, uh, before we can calculate the drainage area, we need to calculate the receiver, the donors. There's another thing we need to build is a stack, which, you know, I, I won't have the time to tell you about. But all these bits are done by little, little bubbles altogether. You can even go more and look what Visualize can do for you if I shift tab in visualize, okay, I can see, for example, I want to show inputs. So go show inputs equals true. So you have to say true. Be careful when you say true, which is the variable, the, the bitwise variable in Python, true, it has to have a capital T, okay, and false has a capital F. If you do this, it will show you by showing where the inputs are. Okay, and you can see which module of process needs which input. But you can also say, show me all the variables. And then you get something that's really complicated because it shows you how the various bubbles are connected between them. For example, this grid things takes my input 
and creates a variable that's called dx and dy, that's the spacing between two points. It builds an array x, which is the coordinates of the grid in the x direction and y, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I see, oh, for example, flow creates something called donors or number of donors or receivers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we see we, we can have access to much more than 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 you know the basic. We can go into details of that model and look at how it's built. Finally, if I uh, uh, I'm going to create a, another cell, so I don't destroy this. So I'm going to add a cell. What you can also do is if you go in basic model, okay, I know that basic model. I'm going to run this again, and it's telling me, for example, there is this thing called SPL. It's one of the processes. So I can go dot SPL and it explains me in much more uh, detail what's in SPL, okay? So it has you know, in, out variables and it explains you what they are. Some of them like shape is a boring variable. It comes from the grid maker. So I don't need to give it as an input to this uh, process, okay? So you see how you can explore all these models. Now, one thing we need to do now is specify the value of these input parameters. Now, what I want you to do now, and we're gonna do this very simply together. Now we have uh, our uh, uh, basic model. Um, and um, I, I want to uh, uh, create uh, or give value to these input variables. So um, oh, I'm on low battery, oh gosh. Uh, Let's, let's take a break for five minutes until I go get my, my charger, okay? Uh, I have to do this um, and, and will be a good time to come back and we'll have about a half hour to... to uh... Is that okay with everyone? Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Better to do this because I don't want to run out of battery. Now. <laughs> I'll be right back in five minutes. We start at 5, 4.30. And yes, how yes. do I insert again uh, one other row as you did last? A cell, I, you mean? Is there a cell? Yes, is there a yeah, shortcut for it? Uh, I'm sure there is a shortcut, but I usually use the the plus. Oh, the plus. Okay. <laughs> server, and, and it will put one after what you just what, the one you were in. Okay. Okay. So yeah. We'll wait a few minutes. I'm sure everyone can stretch a bit. Am I going too fast or? Mm, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I don't know about the others, but. Yes, maybe a bit too fast. Good. I'll try to slow down a bit. It's, it's coming, it was a bit theoretical so far. And are we gonna make a little uh, or more interesting and more visual um, things? John, one question. Yes? Yeah, the things I'm trying to use Conda, but I don't know. I download. Uh, I mean, I run the codes and I have the notebooks and everything. But when I try to import the the XSIM lab module, it seems that 
I don't know. It seems that it doesn't get it or it doesn't go like yeah. I can import NumPy and Matplotlib, but that yeah. one doesn't work. Do you maybe know? Yeah. So so what's really important if if you go that path and down that way, okay, um, is that you you have to create uh, uh, a conda environment like this. Okay, you see my screen? Yeah, so I think I have done that, but... And, and did you uh, activate the environment like this? Uh, yes. And therefore, if, if you've done this, not normally everything is properly installed. And then when you run this command, you, know, you, you um, uh, well, let's to install some, some... Did, did this work too, this uh, lab extension? I think it, it worked, but I had some troubles uh, executing that one. Uh, yeah. Um, and then and then you have to you run your Jupyter lab. Um, so what did you say that didn't work? Which part? It's when you try to load what to import what? Let me maybe I can send you a screenshot uh, through the chat. Yeah. Please. Jan. Jan? Yeah? It did happen the same to me. I did uh, install uh, on my Conda and one of the modules were not imported. Um, I, I don't, where's? I just sent you this screenshot, yeah. direct I'm message. opening it now. Have a look, John. Yeah, it, it's, you know, basically this is a basic, um, uh, package that should be, wait, uh, let me see. Ah, one can, no. Um, if you if if you click on Python three, you see up there. Do you do you see more than one environment coming up, or is it only? You know, in theory, when you click on that, it shows you uh, the different environments that you have access to. Uh, There's no. nothing else but that one. Yes, nothing else. No. I get I get the same problem, and I have no kernel or fastscape source to sync source two instead of Python three. And when you run the Jupyter Lab, you were in the uh, environment S two S future. Yes, so I am in in that folder. So I am in that folder in my like in my Jupyter, and I can see the folder notebooks environment. Yeah, that... but the point is that you know the, this command here, uh, conda activate as to as future drag stone, uh, dragon stone, creates an environment in which you must be. So it's a, a, a conda environment before you can run the Jupyter lab. Because that is, I mean, that part is running the terminal, right? Yeah. So in the terminal, when you run Jupyter Lab, in the prompt, did you have a, uh, you know, telling this is where it's telling you in which environment you are. You should be in S two S future Drax, Dragonstone environment. Mm, I think now I understand what happened. Yeah, probably it's because I run instead of Jupyter Lab, I just run in, in notebook. Ah uh, no no you have to run Jupyter Lab yeah so you, you really have to follow these these uh, you know, the conda activate as two as future grants and will activate the environment in which all the libraries are and then from that environment you know the, the next line you go Jupyter Lab and that should create the the you know run your Jupyter Lab in the proper environment. Okay. Yeah, try this again here. So we're going to continue now. I'm happy to stay a little bit with you guys later uh, to figure this out. But uh, for the others, I, I want to, to continue um, 
uh, playing with with uh, you know, moving on with the uh, uh, the course. So, is everybody back and ready to continue? Good. So, what I'm going to do here first is remove this so that you know that that uh, response is not so large that I can still you know doesn't use too much space on my on my uh, screen. What I can also do, you see, is here if I click on this folder sign, it will remove this, and there's more you know, um, space here for you for you to see what I'm doing. Okay, so you can always bring it back and, and uh, by clicking on that. So what I'm done here, I'm, I've created a new cell. Why? Because what I want you to do is take this line here that you see here, okay? Copy and paste it, but you notice that I have not copied the hashtag. Hashtag in Python means comment. That's basically, I'm gonna run this command without the hashtag. So it will run the command, okay? And you'll see that the command start with a, a percent sign, which means it's, it's, um, uh, it's going to load a, a, what's called an extension, right? You don't need to know the details of that, but you'll see what is going to happen. It's really interesting. You see that the command means extension to X-ray SimLab, create a setup for this model. Okay. And if you do this, what it does, it writes stuff in the cell for you, okay? And it comments out the comment that I just made. So it's, that's why it's called an extension. It's actually typing for you in your cell, in, in your cell. And why does it do that? Because then you don't have to type all this, which is a bit of gibberish, and you only have to fill the blanks. So it's a really nice way to set up a model, so we have a model, we have to give it all the inputs it needs, but having, rather than having to type in all this, which is, you know, the grid shape as a given value, the grid length as a given value, the boundary state as a given value, it will does it for you and you only have to fill in the blanks, the, the value. So let's do this. Uh, you see, uh, what we need is to put a grid shape so we're going to have to put two numbers and in Conda when you, or sorry, in Python, when you do this, you have to put it into square brackets or curly brackets, but here we'll use square brackets. So the grid shape is the number of nodes in the X and Y direction, okay? So I'm gonna put 101 by 101. Okay, I don't put 100, you can put 100, it won't make any difference. I like 101 because, you know, when you divide something like a, a, a hundred kilometers by 101, it means that the space between the 101 point is exactly one kilometer, okay? If you divide by you say 100, then it's gonna be 1.001 kilometer, which is harder to, to see, okay? But it doesn't matter. You can put whatever you want. You can put 200 by 100, you know, 50 by 30. It's the resolution of the model. It's the number of points in the X and Y directions at which you have to solve the solution. And we have to give you know, the spatial dimension of the domain. And again, we have to put two numbers. Now, the first two are integer numbers because it's the number of points. The next two are real numbers or floats, okay? Because that's the extent in kilometers and that can be a non-integer number. It would be, sorry, in meters, not, not in, in kilometers. And so I wanna do something that's hundred kilometers by hundred kilometers. So I can put 100 E3, which is hundred times 10 to the power three, or I can put one E5, okay? That's 100 kilometers. It's 10 to the five meters, okay? And I need to put two, one in the X and one in the Y direction. You could put, you know, longer in the Y, shorter in the X, whatever, okay? We're gonna make a square here. Now, some of the model parameters, we've given them uh, default values. And I'm gonna leave this here. So fixed values for the boundaries means that all four boundaries are fixed, okay? And then a cliff rate, well, let's assume one millimeter per year. I remind you here, all the units for Firescapes are meters and years. So one millimeter per year is 10 to the minus three meter per year. So it's E like this, okay? So that's 10 to the minus three meter per year, so it's one millimeter per year. No, Alex almost got it right when he put the, the K value. So I'm gonna have, a, you know, we could put any value here, but I'm, I'm asking you to use this value, 10 to the minus five. And the units of K are in meter to the power two minus N. Don't ask me why it's like that, okay? 
And then we're going to put again some value for m, the area exponent, the, the default here is 0.4, put 0 0.5, 0 0.45, you know, roughly the area exponent should be half roughly of the slope exponent. That's something uh, we'll, we'll see, okay? And for the slope exponent, let's make it easy. Let's put one. And finally, we haven't really seen here. This is the transport coefficient for the hill slope processes. Doesn't matter. We're going to put one e minus two, and we're going to get rid of this very soon. Don't worry, okay? So this is uh, uh, telling every uh, the code all the input parameters it needs. I remind you, if I look at here, okay, I have all these are the input parameters that I needed. And here I've given a value for all of these parameters. So the model is ready to go. Except one thing, we haven't told this model how often we want to see the solution. That's called the time stepping. I'm going to assume that the, when the model starts, time is zero. And when the model starts, the, 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 the time is, let's say 10 million years to give a number, okay? But I also want, of course, the, the model to go step by step from zero to 10 million years. And the way you do this is by defining a clock, okay? And the clock, you'll see, it's really useful. You have to give it a name. And the name in any language is, is an ASCII character. So you have to put it between uh, a, a comma, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, apostrophes, okay? And you associate it with that name, a set of times at which we're going to calculate the solution. It must include zero and at the end, 10 million years. In between, you can put whatever you want. So here we're gonna say, we've already seen this. I'm gonna use my lin space function in NumPy. I'm gonna say, create a range of number from zero to 10 million, uh, 10 to the power seven. And I want, let's say, 100 time steps, or again, 101, because I want to include zero and 10 million. So let's create a number, you know, a, a range of number from zero to 10 million with a spacing of about 100,000 years, okay? And we're ready. So if we now execute this cell, okay, nothing happens, okay? But there's no mistake. What is done, actually, it's taken my basic model, as this is an input parameter, and create a setup, which have all of this in it, and build an object, which is the model setup called, I can give it any name, I've called it here ds.in, and I can look at it. So let's type ds.in, okay? ds.in has all that I told him. It says that the grid shape is 101 by 101. The grid length is, a you know, 10,000, oh, sorry, uh, 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. My monetary status is this. And then all the values I've put here, okay? It also knows that it's got a, a, a clock, a coordinate called time with that spacing to it. That's all it needs. And now what I can do is run my model. And to run a, a model, you just take this object in which you've put the model, the input parameter, and you're gonna tell, run, run this model. Okay, and the command for that, I'm gonna take it from below here. I'm gonna copy and paste, but it's, it's one of the cells below here, okay? I'm gonna add it here so you see it happening interactively. So it says, take my object in which I put the model, the input parameters, and I'm gonna say X simlab, because it's an X simlab command, run. The only thing, and you know, I'm still discussing this with Benoit, it needs still to re-specify the model. I don't think that's correct, but that's the way it is. But if you do this, okay, and go DSN Sigma run and then execute that cell, it's just gonna run it and done. The model has been run, okay? So what you've done here is you have computed 10 million years of landscape evolution on 100 by 100 grid of nodes uh, using the KS value, the N value, the N value, and the uplift function that you, that you specified. And it's done. You've seen I can run it again. It takes part, you know, 0.1 seconds, I think, to run. And it's telling you I've done it, but it doesn't tell you much about it, okay? It just runs it. So 
what we should do is the result of that. We, we must also ask, you know, I want to see something out of the model. And that comes into these output variables. The output variable says, what do you want to look at? And what, what can I ask? Well, you can ask any, um, any of the variables. So you have access to everything. Oh, sorry. If I go back to the show variables that I had before, okay. I can look at any of these little blocks here. Okay, I can ask you, give me that. Give me that output, okay? And one of them that we find really interesting is obviously topography elevation. That's you know, the, the basic output we want is to look at the topography. So if now uh, in my you know, input uh, design of model, if you want, I have all my input parameters, but I'm also going to put the output parameters. And I'm going to ask for topography, elevation, topography, elevation. Now, elevation is an output of the process topography. And again, this is Python thing. To say that I want elevation out of topography, you have to put in between topography and elevation two underscore. You see, so two, not minus, but underscore. Oh, topography elevation, okay? So it says, I want to see it, but you also have to tell it, how often do you want to see it? And for this, we're going to use time. You see, that's why it's important to give to the clock a name. This is telling me, I want to see topography elevation at every time step, okay? So let's, let's try to, you know, I have to rerun this cell, which modifies my model. I made a mistake as usual. Um, I'm sure it's this, sorry. It's my, I'm a Fortran man, no Python man, okay? So you see now here, I've specified what I want to see and how often I want to see it. Now I can run my model again. If you're really, really careful, it might actually take a little bit longer to run because now it has to save something, okay? But as you look at this now, you see that now there is now a field here called topography elevation, which has some topography built into it. And I can look at it. I can actually, you know, uh, store it on a file uh, or look at the numbers of it. But of course, I, don't, I want to do much more than that. I want to plot it, I want to display it. And in order to do this, what you need to do when you run a model is to put it into a container, another object, which usually we call the out. So the in is the model we've built. And once we run it, the solution, we're gonna put it in the S out, okay? So you see, I've done a lot of stuff in the same, um, uh, in the same cell. I'm gonna run it again now, okay? And it's even worse, nothing at all happened because now instead of giving me the output to the screen, or to the cell, the following cell, it just stores it in DS that out. But all the steps that I've been through now, I actually describe in uh, the, the, all the, the, the cells that are below. Uh, and we are here now, we've run now, DS out equals DS dot in the signal, okay? So I'm going to continue uh, because it's more interactive in my little cell up there, but you know, you can follow all the steps that I've gone through are in, in this, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the cell that are below. So once now we have run and stored the result in ds.out, I can look at ds.out. So I'll create another cell, ds underscore out. I can look at it and it's the same thing, you know, it's got all that stuff that I've put in, but now it also has the solution, which is the topography elevation. And you see, it gives me the dimension of that array. It's a dimension of X and Y because the topography depends on X and Y, but also of time because I've saved the topography elevation for all the time step at which I've calculated it. The clock here for the output variable topography elevation is the same clock as I've used for the calculation. 
Okay, what can I do with the s.out? Well, I can look at topography um, elevation. Okay, and what is topography elevation? Well, topography elevation is an array that has three dimension, one of time, one of X, one of Y. I can look at select time equals zero. Now I only have the initial topography. I can look at one or one. 100, because zero is the first, 100 is the 101, okay? Because it's all this. So this is the last time step, the topography at the last time step, but it's only numbers. There's not much I can do to this. Now, what I can do is plot it. And here it is. You see the strength of putting something like Fastscape model into a framework like what we have been using now, is that it completely um, makes simple, simplifies the way you put in the parameters. And you'll see this looks simple, but we can make this, I mean, we can make the model much, much more complex by changing the, the value of this. I'll show you, we're going to do this in the next few days. But more importantly, we can look at the solution in a very easy way. You know, we don't have to bring this into, you know, another plotting package and look at it and plot it this way, this that. All of this is built in the model. It's the model itself that contains its output and the functions that will allow me to look at it. Okay, look, this is, you know, I, I do this again in front of you so that you realize what's happening. If I run this, it's telling me because I've selected the last time step and by the way, the last time step, you can always get it by saying minus one. So you don't have to remember how many time steps there are. Minus one means the last one. Okay, so it's the same thing here. This is a, a two-dimensional array, okay, that represents a topography. So if I plot it, I get that. But what I can do, so there is a, a function that says, mm, I want to select only where the y equals 50 kilometers, okay? So what it's doing, it's gonna go through my 2D array and gonna select a cross section where Y, no, this is another uh, dimension I have, is equal to 50 kilometers. And now I have a cross section and I can plot it. And I have a cross section through the model. I can do all sorts of things with this. I can mean in the X direction, which I keep misspelling, and plot it. That's the mean elevation in the X direction. I can look at the max elevation in the X direction. Okay, so you see how all of this can be achieved uh, simply by looking at the model, which is this thing, I extract from it one of the output that I've decided to look at. I extract one time step and then I plot it. If I hadn't you know, plot selected this and I did this, what I would get is a 2D plot of Y, that's the mean elevation in the X, uh, average in the X direction plotted against the Y direction. And then I would have the time here. And I have this 2D vision of how the mean topography has evolved through time. All of this we're going to use in, 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 in other notebooks with, with, with great uh, fun, okay? But you realize how, how easy it is to do these things with these simple, you know, select or I select. But the difference between select is when, you know, if I, if I want to uh, do a select um, Y equals, as I said before, let's go X equals a 50 kilometer. Okay, so again, now what I have is it's a function of time, not the mean, but a cross section at x equals 50. And if I, uh, I select is because time, okay, I, I've decided to say time is the last time step. Okay, you can do it this way and it does that. But I could say select time equals 1e7, which is 10 million years, and it will do the same thing. 
Okay, so sell or I sell means I'm making a choice for an index or for a value. This is, you know, basic Python in a sense, but you know, to get to this level, you know, we, we needed to develop, and Benoit did a great job developing this framework and put Fastcape into it. Um, one other thing you can do, and I'm going to show you, I think there is this, this, this uh, I, I, I don't want to type it again, but this is again the same, the same um, uh, cell, which you know has been modified and you can copy and paste it uh, compared to the previous one. The only thing I've done here is I've added a second clock, which I've called out clock. Okay. And when you do this, okay, what you, you can use that clock to do something else. And for example, that clock goes from zero to 10 million years, but only with 11 time steps. So that's every million year. And then here, you see my output variables. I said, I want to look at topographic elevation, but only every 10, every million year, not every 100,000 years. So I'm only outputting every 10 times that maybe because I don't have much space and I want to save everything. Another thing you can do is output something else, okay? So for example, something that we really like is drainage area. Now let's go um, back to my big bubble thing here. And I can see there is this thing called drainage, which computes something called area, okay? All these things are all explained and reference and, and in the manual for uh, Fastscape, um, this here, okay? So for each model, you know exactly which process is in there. And for each process, you can go and look what are all the variables, all, uh, and for each of these, you can look at what each of the variables are, what they represent. You know, everything is explained in the manual. But of course, we've also named things so that can make sense. So drainage, clearly something that computes drainage area, computes area, okay? So I can ask, I go back to the cell that I was playing with here to output also drainage area, okay? Don't forget to put two underscore here. And again, I want to go out, okay? At a, at a, okay. Now, um, you know, this cell now, if I run it, will recreate a new model with a new input model called DS in. Yeah, I'm gonna do this. So now my DS in, okay, has uh, this other clock that helps me uh, getting the output at fewer time step and get more output, get the drainage area too. Now let's run it again. Now there's another decorator here, which I put here, which is very useful when you run the model, it shows you a, a, a a progress bar, okay? So all I've done, you know, I can comment this out. Now if I run it, oops, sorry. If I run it like this, nothing happens. And then after a couple, um, half a second, it's, it stops. If you wanna see the progress, you add this, don't forget to tab like this, okay? And then, and then you, you see it happening, okay? Now I've done all these plots, I'll do it again. Okay, so now I'm gonna do what we've done before. Huh? So you see my DS, I look at topography elevation, I select the last time step and I plot it. This is what it looks like. Now note that it's so fast to run Fastscape that you know, I can run it again and look at it again, and it's gonna look different. It's different because of course, the initial random noise that I'm using is different. And so the solution is different. Okay, but it has all the same characteristic, you know, the topographic, the maximum height is about 4,000 meters. If I was, for example, just as an example, make the coefficient much smaller. So let's say 10 to the minus seven instead of 10 to the minus five. I rerun that cell, run the model, and then look at the topography. What happened? Well, it's much bigger because it can't erode fast enough to get there. Okay, and I've slowed down the process of erosion and I'm getting a mountain that's totally unreasonable. It's gonna be tens of thousands of meters high, okay? If I, on the other hand, put this down to 10 to the minus, sorry, uh, was it 10 to the minus five, let's put 10 to the minus three, so a very efficient coefficient now, really fast erosion. I'm gonna run it 
and look at the topography. Oh, looks the same, but look, my mountain is only 35 meters high. So Marine, you were asking, you know, what's the value of KF? Well, we know that mountain belts of the order of a few thousand meters, not, you know, 50,000 meters and not 35 meters. So that's how I've chosen the value of 10 to the minus five. It gives me a mountain that has a reasonable height, a few thousand meters. Okay. I'll, I'll finish because time is running by showing you another very uh, important things. And there are other ways to look at the solution. One is called this HV plot, okay? Uh, you can run it, uh, you know, again, it, you see, it takes, you have to import it, it's a new library. It takes my output, the topography elevation, and then instead of plotting it, it does an HV plot. And hover plot, as it's called, allows you to make interactive plots. So when you run it, okay, it brings this plot, the same almost as this guy here. It allows you to investigate more. You see, when I, if I put my, my cursor on it, it gives me the value of the topography, but also brings this cursor, which you can play and play time or something else with. Okay, so it's a more interactive way of looking at the solution. And at the end, which I think you, know, you can see that the landscape is growing, growing, growing about halfway here, it's kind of reached its final topography and then it's not really moving much. We've reached steady state. You can you know, look at it, you can zoom, you can, this is quite a, a nice way to, to look at a, at a plot like this. Finally, something that Benoit and I spend a lot of time to is this, 3D visualization with um, widget, as they call them. So again, it's something you have to import, okay? And then you feed the DS out, you know, my, the output of my model, the object that represents the model and its output. You give it as an argument to this top of this three. You have to specify dimension of a canvas or a plot. And you also have to tell it that the dimension used for time is out, okay? Which is the dimension we have used to store the output. And then we do that. And there's a few little things here that you don't really need is to, make, to make it look, now I'm gonna take these away. Uh, so all you do is you put this into app and run the app. And then what it does, it creates this 3D viewer, you know, which now has the topography and you can you know, interactively change go through time. You can set the vertical exaggeration. You can look at it in 3D. You can play it as a movie and you can play it so that it repeats itself. So, you know, there we go. I'm gonna mesmerize you as, as we go. And as it plays, you can change the exaggeration. You can look at different things. Now you remember, here, I've asked to get the topography and the drainage area. So when I plotted this, I could have replaced topography elevation with drainage area, and I would have the drainage area. Here in the 3D viewer, you can also select the drainage area. Okay, and of course the drainage area is, is a very non-linear thing. You know, it's it increases dramatically uh, downstream, so that you know the, the drainage area is obviously maximum. I'm going to stop this because we're going to get crazy all of us. So if I go to the last time step uh, and look from top, you'll see. And I want to do also. I'm going to make it look reasonable. Okay, and I'm going to so you see the main rivers uh, or the main streams flowing off that mountain. Okay, so these are, you know, basic tools that you have to look at the solution. And we're gonna look more and more in detail into this. Uh, you know now how to build a model. And, you know, the cool thing about uh, Fastscape is that you can play with all the parameters and it runs super fast. So um, what I suggest you do, um, and hopefully you, you, you'll have enough fun and pleasure to do it is, Tonight, A, I'm happy to stay a little bit with some of you today to make sure that everyone has a working version of Fastscape, that we can do this. But what I suggest strongly you do, that might be, is that you play with this notebook uh, to play with the landscapes, uh, change the K, change the M, change the N, change the uplift rate, 
um, uh, change the grid resolution and see what happens. No, let's do this. Let's be bold. Okay, let's do a big ramp here. You know, a thousand by a thousand. Now you see it's going to take a little bit longer. Now it's going to take a hundred times longer, so about a hundred seconds. But it's still definitely manageable. It's not going to run overnight. Okay, so I said a hundred times slower because Fastscape is border random. The num the time it takes grows linearly with the number of points you put in the system. So if you go from you know 100 by 100 to 1,000 by 1,000, your grid is 100 times finer, there's 100 times more nodes, and it's gonna take 100 times more time. But you know, um, at the end of the day, nothing will change and we can still look at the solution. It will look much more detaily if you want, but it, it, will, it will run in, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, now, I talked a lot. Uh, I hope you got a little bit out of this. Uh, tomorrow, I'll go much slower with the other notebooks because I'll assume we'll have the basis and we can analyze more uh, what we see rather than actually physically doing things uh, like I've done. But I'm happy to take questions now. Let's put, bring back the, um, the chat. Uh, not because I have much chat, but I'm happy to listen to you. Uh, for you know any question you have on this, and then I will stay. I'm happy to stay with those of you who haven't uh, managed to get this to work to make sure that we all have a, a working version, either using Conda or Docker. Uh, Jean, when yes? you did the cross section above, yes? uh, just to be sure, uh, what's Y for? Because everything has a name like X and everything, and just Y hasn't. Okay, so let's go us? back. To, yeah, let's go back to um, this one. Well, it can be any. Huh? Okay, so let's look at the command here. It says DS out. So I take the model and I extract from it. I want to look at the topography elevation. Then I select, I, I go in there and I say, give me out of the topography elevation all the nodes that have x equals to five. Uh, 50 kilometers. So it's going to look in all the nodes that it has for all those that have x equals 50 kilometers. And of course, that's going to be a line of points that have different y value, but all have the same x value. And then I tell it here, only look for the time step 10 million, the last time step. Okay. And if I plot this, I know obviously I've just run the, the model again, so I should do it in the map. You know, um, it, it's confused because I run the model somewhere else. But if I go back, let's say here, I can do this again now. So let's do it. DS out dot uh, topography elevation dot. Uh, so I want to select X, um, no, sorry, X equals 50 kilometers and select you know, the last or oh, out, the last time step and then plot it. Okay, I get this you know, super high resolution because I have a thousand points in the X direction. But I get, you know, I get a plot, it knows that the only variable that's left is Y. Everything has been specified before. X is 50, time is minus one or time is 10 million years, okay? And so all it can do is plot the topography elevation, which is what I've asked here, as a function of y. But I can plot you know, another cross section and another location, that's what it looks like. Or you know, if I look along the boundary, it's gonna look crazy because that's the random noise between zero and one meters that I've put in the boundary that hasn't changed. Okay, et cetera. What, the, what is the name of y that's with well, every explanation, I forgot it. It's the coordinate, isn't it? It's the coordinate. You see what, what we've you. done here, you see? We, we have said that there are, we need two coordinates and we've given them you know, by definition, because it's a spatial model, um, it assumes that the two coordinates, the spatial coordinates have name X and Y. Now, a clock is another coordinate, it's the time coordinate. And here, we don't have any default. We have to put it in because we usually define, define more than one clock for the reason I'll explain. Whereas the spatial coordinate is only two and it's always going to be, everybody calls them X and Y. That's why we've, we've done this, okay? 
Thank so you, if I look at that. this, if I just type, um, you know, um, uh, I'm going to create another cell. If I just look at DS out and look at it, it tells me that topography elevation, you know, has dimension of out, which is a time, uh, one every million year, X and Y. So when I do a selection here, I can use and select X, Y, and out. And the one that I don't select appears as a plot, as a dimension on the plot. Uh, Jean? Yes? Question. Uh, for some reason, the HV plot didn't work in my notebook. It's, yeah, uh, uh, it's exactly like your code, but... Uh, but... Yeah, everything has worked. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The, the reason for this, and it's it's an incompatibility between HV plot and the new version of Jupyter Lab. Oh, okay. So for me, it works because I, I've, you know, and for those who are using the Docker, we have downgraded Jupyter Lab to its version two. Oh. So that HV plot works. Okay. Now, I, we, we're working hard on making this to work, and, and it doesn't depend only on us. It depends on the people who have developed HV plot, which is not us. Okay. So I don't think it's so important. I believe that you know the this 3D viewer <laughs> is, is a better way to look at it. Or you know, if you want to go into the details, use the simple, you know, what's called X-ray way of looking at uh, th this way of making cross section or plot like this. But it, I, I like the HV plot because that's the tool we had at the beginning. Uh, but uh, before we had the 3D viewer, but you know, this is the way free software evolved with time. Uh, they make an improvement to Jupyter Lab and it breaks uh, HV plot. But apparently Benoit tells me that it should happen very soon, that, that it will work. Oh, okay, no, thank you. Other questions? So I, I you know, um, um, this is really a crash cor uh, course on, on Fastscape and the, um, um, uh, X-ray SimLab, so the, the, the framework that we've used to put uh, Fastscape. What, what I, I want you to also uh, take from this and from the rest of the week is, you know, we've put a lot of effort to put Fastscape into this framework, which make it very easy to use, very interactive. And the development that we're going to do, especially Caroline and, and Amanda and, and maybe others, to track, Amanda, that's her role to track grain size and Caroline to look at the weathering problems. All this, we're going to add them as new models or processes in the framework so that they are, as soon as we develop them, they will be available to you. So I urge you to learn how to use the model because all of you who will at one point want to use or need to use the model, I think by far, this is the best way to access Fastscape and it makes an easy way to debug things and find problem because all you have to do is send me one of these notebooks or to Benoit and we can easily find where the problem is if you have a problem. And it, as I said again, you know, a very easy way to look at the output. Now, this is all gimmicks and, and, and graphics, but we can also do lots of things by exporting this into an Excel table if you want to do you know, for publication or the plot that I have here, we can make it look really nice and then export it to a PDF inside the notebook. Or you can export for other software like Paraview uh, can take the output from Fastscape and, and display it in 3D. So you know, it, it helps, but it doesn't prevent a, the usual way of doing things. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I can see you again, see you're still alive. And uh, if you don't have any more question, uh, say let's meet again tomorrow, unless uh, some of you want yeah, Jean? To help. Yes? Jean? Yes? Yeah, I, I have a small question. I remember uh, seeing Benoit showed us, um, uh, you know, that uh, um, instead of uh, displaying uh, through time, uh, displaying through a set of parameters. Yes. Like if we want to test uplift rates and yes. have just the final topography, how can we do that? I, I will show it to you tomorrow. 
Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's, it's a very, very. Okay, the, the, you think it's a very simple model, and you can just change m n or the uplift, and then you get a different landscape. Okay, it's it's much more than that, because you know any of the input parameters that you give to Farscape can be itself a very complex uh, array or set of arrays. And you can even give more than one as an input parameter. If one parameter, Farscape only expect one value and you give it 10, well, it's gonna run 10 models with the 10 values and will give you an output that is the output of the 10 models with an extra variable, which is the variable, the input variable. So in the same model, you're gonna be able to say, hmm, what if I change the uplift rate and that multiplied by two? Well, you can have an output in which you say, okay, this is the solution for this uplift rate. And then look at the same time at the solution with double the uplift rate and you can compare them very easily. And when you, uh, Fastscape runs stuff, you know, more than one model, it will do it using the different cores in your machine. So you can run these things in parallel. It won't take more time. So we'll see all that tomorrow. We'll see all that uh, in another notebook, but it's, it's another very useful feature to explore models. And we've only started by playing with the basic model. We want to include the sediments. We want to include the marine component. And, and you'll see, I you know we're going to produce deltas and fans and, and you know, offshore um, uh, margins, et cetera in the coming days. So who wants to start solving his problem of implementation or uh, installation? Esteban, are you, did you fix your problem or are you still have yeah, a yes. I, I managed to fix it. The thing is like, it seems that every time, I mean, to use Conda, it seems that every time you have to, from the terminal to activate Conda. Yes. Exactly. So you have to activate the environment. And Conda is this thing that it's a little bit like the, the Docker, but it's it's not at, at the same level. What it creates, it's when you activate an environment in the terminal, it gives you access to the libraries you have loaded in that environment. And yeah. think, for example, I made the point that, oh, you know, HV plot only works with version two of JupyterLab. But there are other things that only work with version three of JupyterLab. So what I have on my computer is several environments. Some of them have Jupyter two, ver JupyterLab version two and HVplot. And another one has Jupyter three, the version three of JupyterLab with another thing that only works on the Jupyter three. And so if I wanna use HVplot, I know I have to be in the environment that allows me to do that. And everything else is the same, but I have another environment where I want, don't wanna use HVplot and I wanna use something else. So I have maybe 50 environments on my computer depending on what I want to do, but they are separated from each other. And I know that when I'm in the environment, I know exactly what I have. So if you don't use environment and you install everything in the single environment, then it may be conflicting and you will have to reinstall JupyterLab 2 when you want to use it, it's a nightmare. So Conda allows you to do this in environment. And Docker is even more than that. It's kind of even creating his own little computer with his own little hard disk on your computer. So you're really certain that all you need is there and, and you don't have to worry about even about activating an environment. Uh, Sean, I have a question. Yes. Uh, yes. In case I close my terminal, Docker and <laughs> yes. everything. Yeah, that's a good question. Let me, let me show you one last thing. Okay? Let me show you. Right. Don't do what I'm going to do. Okay. Don't do what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you something, okay? So hopefully I can still share my screen now and it will work. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I'm still here. Now I want to go to sleep. It's, you know, I know all of you are going to work and play with this until like three in the morning. <laughs> and, but it's still, uh, I need to go to sleep because Sebastian is teaching to me. So I want to stop this. I want to turn my computer on, okay? So remember, uh, I'm going to switch this on like this so we can see the, the browser. I, I, I've made all this change in my notebook. So I do Apple save to save it or I save it here, so it's saved. And now I can leave this and of course I can come back to it. Okay, and, and it will be exactly as I left it. Oh, um, if it wants to come back, yeah, here it comes, okay? <laughs> but now what I want to do is stop everything, okay? So what to do this, you want to stop the JupyterLab server, okay? 
So you go file, shut down. Okay, so be careful here. You have so many menus of uh, under menus of the menus. Okay, there's the menu of Safari, which is the okay, okay, which is the, the, the menu for my browser. Mm -hmm. There is the Jupyter Lab menu, which is this guy, and then there is the notebook menu <laughs> here. Okay, it's three levels. You want to go into Jupyter Lab menu, and if you file, it says shut down. So don't do this. I'm going to do it, but don't do it. Okay, so shut down, back, shut down, shut down. All right. Now, server is stopped. I can close this window. All right? And it's done. No, don't do it. Wait. Let's go back now to my uh, uh, terminal where I issued that command, okay, which started the server. You see that while the server was working, it was pushing, putting all this gibberish at, this, at the terminal, okay? But now it's telling me kernel shut down. The Jupyter Lab notebook that I started is gone. Okay, the the, the Jupyter Lab server which I know is gone. I have to restart it to start. Now let's try to restart it. I reshoot the Docker run, blah 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 blah, and I run it, and then I'm going to run into trouble. He says, "No, I can't do this. It's not working." Why? Because it's not only trying to restart the Jupyter Lab; it's also trying to restart the Docker the Dragonstone Docker, the little computer in which I'm supposed to be, okay? And it can't because the Docker already exists. It's still running on my computer. So in order to restart the whole thing, you first have to kill the Docker. And you say, Docker, stop with the name of the Docker, which here is Dragonstone, Dragonstone. And even better, it's in all that, and even better, you say Docker, remove Dragonstone to make sure that it's really gone, okay? And now your that little computer that was working in the background is gone out of your computer. If anything, you know, the computer should slow down a little bit because it's not trying to do all these other things that it was doing in this fake other computer. And now from this, you can restart the command to run the Docker. So I'm gonna run it again now. And now it's working fine. I can, again, that's tomorrow morning, you'll do that. Okay, or tomorrow afternoon, open the tag here, put that in, run it, and I have my thing start again. But be careful, you have to go back into my local folder, notebooks, and in the local folder, don't go on the one that's on your fake computer, because this one has not been updated. This one is still the old one, not the one that we've modified. Yep. If I go in my local folder, notebooks, mountain source, and that second one, okay, you know, it restarts. It has all the modifications I've done, uh, you see, mm -hmm. and, and all the outputs are still there, okay, and all the mistakes I made is still there, okay? So the, 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 the key, when you go to sleep tonight, Okay, I'll do it again because I'm going to go to sleep. Now I'm going to stop this. I go file, shut down, shut down. Now I can close this window and do something else. I go in terminal and I do the famous, oops, sorry, stop Dragonstone, Docker, remove Dragonstone. Okay, and Dragonstone is the name you've given to the, uh, you know, when you, when you, when we run. The, the Docker run, we had minus minus name Dragonstone. This is where the name comes from. So if you've put another name there, okay, when you run the Docker, you have to use that name. And I'll do it again. And now, tomorrow morning, I go to sleep, and tomorrow morning, I can restart it. Okay? Okay. Thanks a lot for that. Yeah, sorry. I, I, <laughs> that was a very important thing for me to say. Yeah. And I to say it. <laughs> Thanks for asking. But the, the, the great thing with this Docker is that it creates an environment I can work in it. I know everything is installed. It should be exactly identical to mine. And Everton, you've been doing this on your PC. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. it was strange because in the PowerShell, it didn't work at all. But when, yeah. I, start, when I tried with the CMD terminal, yeah. then it worked just fine. Yeah. And, and, yeah. I, and I've tried it on four different Macs here that have different operating systems. One that had never installed Conda, one that never installed any of the, and it all worked fine. So okay. the, the, the Docker for this kind of course is really ideal. So you, you yeah. should, you know, yeah. Any other problem that needs to be solved with the installation?
Wow, I'm surprised. That's great. Okay, everyone, uh, here is someone who ask, <laughs> asking me to go home now. So uh, I guess it's the same for you. Eh? Um, uh, I'll see you tomorrow. I think if I look at the plan, we start again tomorrow at uh, nine. Uh, yes, nine o'clock with more of your presentations. And then tomorrow we'll look more at what happens in, in the sink, in the basin. Um, of course, we, what we, we will do a little bit more exercise or notebooks uh, at five or three uh, on the source because I want to look at, at the river profile. Okay, that's one of the notebooks. And I want to see how the mountain reacts to variation in precipitation rate. This is notebook three and four. And then later we'll look at the, at the sink, at the basin, what happens in the, in the transfer zone. Okay. Okay, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this. I wasn't too fast or incoherent. Um,